So this is 66 years old female patient, Mrs. G from Bega. Housewife is admitted and involved with chief complaints of slurring of speech for the past 10 days. Weakness of right upper and lower limbs. So deviation of angle of mouth to the left for the past three days. The history of chronic illness. The patient was apparently normal since uh, till August 9, 2023, when she had uh, sudden onset slurring of speech, but the relatives did not notice any facial deviation or uh, limb weakness. So she was brought to a local hospital and the imaging was done. This was right-sided subcortical impact involving right coronal radiator, right ganglio-capsular region, and sacral aneurysms involving left cavernous segment of ICU. It was partially thrombosed, and MCA M2 segment was completely thrombosed. So she was advised to go to higher center. So on August 22 evening, while she was in a train, she developed sudden onset weakness of right upper limb and right lower limb, with deviation of angle of mouth to the left. So she went to a different hospital where they have done an NCCT. It shows a left ganglio capsular infarct. So subsequently, she came to CMC for further management. So past history, diabetes, uh, diagnosed with diabetes mellitus before 10 days in a local hospital. She has also known case of systemic hypertension for past 20 years on regular medication. She also gives a history of right sided weakness in 2012, but the details was not available. So also his case of coronary artery disease in 2012, for which also details were not, not available. So personal history, no addiction, she had normal bowel and bladder habits. So she was vitally stable at time of examination and CNS examination in GCS was 15 by 15. She was normal sensorium. She had deviation of angle of mouth to the left, hypotonia in right upper and lower limbs, a power in right upper and lower limbs were three by five, deep pendant reflexes exaggerated in right side, planned up withdrawal in right side. Other system, other system examination was used within normal limits. So this is a patient who presented a recurrent, recurrent stroke syndrome with left-sided IC and MC aneurysm. So went to work up with her. So we did a carotid artery Doppler. It was a carotid plaque in left distal CCA causing less than 50% stenosis. So when I go to the MRI brain, it also shows a left-sided IC aneurysm involving distal cavernous screener and supraclinar segments. It was partially uh, thrombosed. There was a, also a left MC aneurysm, it was completely thrombosed. So it, there was a multiple infarct, so acute infarct in the left high frontal and subcortical location, acute lacrimal infarct in the right uh, high frontal region. There was actually there sub, uh, multiple subacute infarcts in the brain. So after getting an IR opinion, we ended up with a cerebral angiography. It shows a left ICA showing a large aneurysm measuring 13 into 11 to 3 millimeters of big aneurysm in a supraclinar segment pointing posterior inferiorly. So another small wide neck aneurysm we see involving a superior division of left MCA measuring 78 millimeter. So we suspected that the thrombosis, uh, the thrombosis aneurysm is causing a recurrent embolus, which is causing the recurrent stroke syndrome in this patient. So I like to talk a few points about this uh, uh, aneurysm. So risk factors and uh, associated condition for intracranial aneurysm. The most common uh, risk factor is hypertension, so other factors are tobacco smoking, autosomal dominant palsy kidney disease, ehlers danlos syndrome, fibromuscular dysplasia. So our patient has hypertension as the most common risk factor. So risk of aneurysm rupture. So our patient has a cavernous artery aneurysm with 13 millimeter. The risk of rupture is 3 percentage. So it's a faces aneurysm risk score. This score actually uh, says uh, what's the risk of aneurysm rupture. So this score includes population, hypertension, age, size of aneurysm, whether any SAH for the from other another aneurysm, site of aneurysm. So for our patient, the phase score is seven. So the risk of aneurysm rupture is two to four percentage in the five years. So the, when the score is high, the risk of uh, rupture of this aneurysm is very high. So this is a different grade LAP score. Uh, it predicts the risk of aneurysm growth. So this are, the score includes subarachnoid hemorrhage, location, age, population, size of the aneurysm. So LF score low, less than nine is uh, the exponent, the cumulative growth risk of the aneurysm is very less. So it's a moderate means is 10 to 19. When the LF score is more than or equal to 20, the, the cumulative growth risk is very high. So don't, don't send don'ts for, for an unruptured aneurysm. So inform the patient, uh, the do's and don'ts actually. We should counsel the patient that uh, there's a patient, is a, the patient is having aneurysm, it may rupture, but we should not threaten the patient. And we should ask the patient to uh, abstain smoking. So counsel about sm smoking cessation. So we should treat the arterial hypertension um, and the avoids. So, so based on single criterion, we must not make the patient, uh, threaten the patient. So we should not avoid the patient to uh, restrict exercise sports, etc. So if the patient is having two first 
uh, first degree relatives are having uh, aneurysm, we can advise uh, uh, genital screening. So follow up, follow up the patient. Uh, if the patient we are not for keeping, if are not treating the patient by surgery or any endovascular techniques, we can follow up the patient. So we can follow up the patient with MRI or CT at regular intervals as indicated. So optimal interval is not known is a class one recommendation. In class two B recommendation, they, they have said the follow up with the patient after every six to twelve hours after initial recovery, then every yearly after uh, after that. So it's better to use MRI uh, TOF MRI than CTA for long term follow up. The family screening. If the patient is having more than two family members with intracranial aneurysm or subarachnoid hemorrhage, should be offered aneurysmal screening by CT or MRI. So, if the patient is having any uh, hypertension, smoking, and if the patient is female, there is a high risk of aneurysm. Uh, if the patient is having autosomal polycystic ki kidney disease, and uh, if the patient is having some coagulation of iota, so microcephalic osteodysplastic primordial dwarfism, these patients are also have a high risk of uh, aneurysm. So risk benefit and it's a positive treatment. Actually, there is no specific guidelines of which size aneurysm we should operate and which size aneurysm we should follow. So they want to study risk benefit analysis for treatment of unruptured intracranial aneurysm. If the aneurysm, the size of the aneurysm is less than seven millimeter in diameter, and it is it's the incidental, incidentally diagnosed anterior aneurysm, we can follow up the patient. If you treat the aneurysm, the life expectancy reduces. So if the other cases, the patient is having aneurysm, incidental aneurysm more than seven millimeter, are in the posterior circulation aneurysm. So if you treat the patient, the life expectancy increases. So it's less than seven millimeter. We should wait wait for the patient. If it's more than seven centimeter, we can treat the treat the patient. So in 2003, uh, international data on unruptured aneurysm. So it compared the both surgical and endovascular treatment with no treatment on un unruptured intracranial aneurysm. For patient 50 years, if the aneurysm is less than five, seven millimeter, if it's located in the cavernous artery territory. If the aneurysm is very large, less more than 25 millimeter, and located in the posterior circulation, we can wait on the patient. We are not, we are we can follow up the patient. For more than 40 years, if the aneurysm is less than seven millimeter and is more than 25 millimeter, located in the cavernous artery, and if it's less than seven millimeter and located in the anterior circulation, we can wait on the patient. Actually, this patient, we, our patient has a aneurysm of size 13 millimeter. So the problem is she is having a complete thrombosis, is causing recurrent strokes. So, so we uh, suggested neurosurgery and uh, IA. They advised to put a flow diverter in the both the aneurysms. So we discharge the patient and we advised to follow up a neurosurgery OPD for further management, uh, flow diverter insertion. So thank you. Thank you. Any question? So I mean, you, you highlighted uh, you know the risk of rupture. Uh, this is a here, you actually had a thrombosis of the aneurysm, isn't it? Yes. Both aneurysm with thrombosis, one yes. partially, one completely. And that's not common. Yes. So what is it that, what is that, I mean, if, if, it, if it's thrombosed, uh, does our management change? Yeah, and we consult a neurosurgery, a neuro, neural neural so whether you start dual antiplatelets and uh, anticoagulation, they suggested because of the risk of bleeding, continue, we continue only single antiplatelets and statins. So all this risk of uh, rupture you talked about, um, if it thrombosis, what happens to the risk of rupture? Of rupture. Not sure. Not sure. Exactly, less likely to rupture. Or it may rupture later on. When it, it might recanalize and then rupture later on. So actually it reduces your risk of rupture. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That was a... A wonderful varied collection of uh, cases. We learned a lot. Um, I just uh, had a couple of uh, things. I mean, uh, some of these names like of the cases. Uh, sometimes I can't really seem to make out the connection. Is um, so I would suggest don't force yourself to make an amazing name. Sometimes it is possible. Sometimes it's not possible. So sometimes you can just say what say something simpler. I'm guessing. Uh, okay, so the best presentation, uh, I would say, was probably Vineet from M1. Yeah.